So before we get started, um, I have a few announcements and I want to chat with you about my organization of today's lecture and our Wednesday lecture and see how we can better prepare you for the midterm exam that's coming. So first of all, I hope Dr. Anderson took good care of you on our last Friday lectures, on our last Friday's lecture. Um, so today, what I want to do is spend about like 15 to 20 minutes talking about the confirmation of substituted ethane. So that's where we left over last Wednesday. And then for the rest of the class, um, I created a list of topics we covered so far from day one all the way until today. And also we can go over the list and also I can chat about what I expect you to know on those topics. With that in hand, while we're going over the list, what I will do is I'll ask everyone to vote. So if we went over a topic you feel specifically concerned or you want me to spend more time on it, I'll spend some time to prepare a um, practice problem on our Wednesday's lecture so we can go together. And regarding for other detailed announcements and detailed arrangements for the midterm exam, I will be posting a Canvas announcement. I'm still drafting it. There are lots of details I want to take care of. For example, you can use your note on your iPad. You just cannot um, connect to internet, right? You can use your molecular kit during the midterm exam, but you should not pass the molecular kit to your classmate during the exam. So if you have your molecular kit, perfect. If you want to borrow your molecular kit from your friend or your classmate, you want to do that before the exam begins. All right, so during the exam, we do not allow passing of the molecular kit. I'll also address other problems like when, the, um, when and where the exam gonna take place, how many problems are there, how many questions are there, what are the regret policy, et cetera, et cetera on our Canvas announcement. So stay tuned. I'm drafting that. I should be able to get that posted later this afternoon. All right. Any questions before we get started on today's lecture? All right. I'll also stay outside for any questions you, uh, any questions you may have, whether it's administrative or it's material related. I'll stay outside for your questions. OK. And do we have any more general questions before we get started? Yes. So the answer is you can bring your own periodic table, your own constant. I don't care which version you use. They're all the same. Um, so it's open notes. So bring whatever you like. As long as it's not connected to internet, I'm fine with it. You can use any kind of calculator too. OK, that's it. Yes. Yeah, I just covered that. You can bring your iPad. You just cannot connect it to the internet. Yes. Yes, the midterm will include today's content. Um, I'll go over the list, and you'll see what's my expectation of you. All right, so let's save some time and get started on today's lecture. First thing, I want to finish talking about confirmation of substituted ethane. So this is where we left over. On our last Wednesday, we spent lots of time looking at the molecular kit and then build that molecular kit, drawing these Newman projections. Right? Remember, you can draw it either the wedge dash way um, that we normally do, or you can look through a specific carbon-carbon bond and draw the staggered or the eclipse conformation out of it. Right? So this one would be a staggered conformation where your group on the top and the group on the bottom are relatively away from each other. Rotating either the top or the bottom by 60 degrees, you get the eclipse conformation, means the top and the bottom atoms or groups are relatively closer to each other. And the eclipse is less stable comparing to the staggered conformation. We also went over drawing of these um, transformations or the rotation of that single bond for ethane. We can see this picture here is pretty symmetric. You start from the staggered conformation. You rotate either the top or the bottom carbon by 60 degrees. It doesn't matter which direction you rotate it. It also doesn't matter whether you rotate the top one or the bottom one. You end up with a similar looking potential energy surface. And on the y-axis here, that's the torsional energy, x-axis, that's the degree you rotate it. So while we're talking about ethane, 
what we have, the energy difference between the standard conformation and the eclipse conformation is about 2.9 kilocompromore. So that's when we're talking about the eclipse of the hydrogen atom. The next question becomes, what if we have something more than hydrogen atom? So that comes to our first topic of, topic of today, which is rotation of the substituted ethane. So in this case, we're using propane as an example. So the way to imagine this is now instead of having only hydrogen, here the blue and the red one are still hydrogen. I'm just using it as a placeholder for different kind of hydrogen so you can know what I'm talking about. And here um, we also have a CH3, which is methane in, in place. All right. So first thing first, before we draw, the new moon projection, let's just practice drawing that wedge dash conformation again together. So the way we draw it is you first define a plan where you put that carbon atom. So in this case, what I do is that I put these two are my carbon of interest, and then I put this methyl group, and let's see, and this hydrogen here on the same plan. So this is what I want it to be. We have the carbon, carbon, hydrogen. Um, white hydrogen, and then the carbon here on the same plan. So when they're on the same plan, when you're drawing it in wedge dash, you just use a com common line connecting them. So what we end up with is something like that, right? So all these four groups, the hydrogen, carbon, carbon, methyl, they're all on the same plan to each other. Here we define the plan first. Next up, you draw the rest of the molecule using the wedge dash conformation or wedge dash notation. So because this is our plan of interest, and it's obvious now in the middle carbon, we have a blue hydrogen that's wedged out towards you. So here the viewpoint is our camera. So the blue one is wedged towards you. So we can draw it like this. And then the red one is dashed away from you on that middle carbon. Likewise, you can have on the terminal carbon, the red one is coming away um, towards you. And then the blue one is on the bottom there. And that's the way we draw it. Obviously, for the same molecule, you have different ways in drawing this notation. So as long as they're consistent, you're good to go. So for example, if I flip it like this, now these four are still on the same plan, but now on the middle one, you have the red one wedge out, the blue one dash in, and um, etc. So if, for the same molecule, it doesn't there is no one single absolutely correct answer. It's the relative position of these wedges and dashes are more important. All right, so this is a bit of review, is how to draw it, how to draw your wedge and dash notation. The new thing comes to when we're drawing the Newman projection. So in this case, let's just highlight the single bond, and we want to look through that single bond, and we're drawing the Newman projection here. And just by random choice, I want to put uh, my methyl group, the carbon with my methyl group on the top. That's the viewpoint we want to show. So this is the carbon-carbon bond we're viewing through. And here, let's just do it together. Looking at it, right now we have the staggered conformation. The groups are staggered with each other. So we can first draw the circle. And then here we have the methyl on the top carbon that's pointing to the top. And then here we have the blue and the red hydrogen accordingly. And on the bottom, we have this um, white hydrogen that's opposing the CH3. Here you have the blue hydrogen and the red hydrogen. All right. And um, well, obviously, this is our staggered conformation. And this one is more stable. Okay. 
Likewise, if we rotate our chemical bonds, let me just rotate the bottom one by 60 degrees. Again, it doesn't matter which one you rotate or which direction you rotate. I'm just using it randomly. And then we can create another Newman projection for the same molecule, but now it's a different conformation. First, you draw the same. The top one remains the same. So we have the CH3, hydrogen, hydrogen. And here we have hydrogen. Wait, no, that's wrong. Sorry. And look at it. This hydrogen, the white one, is now eclipsed below that blue one. So we have it here. The red one is eclipsed below the CH3. And then the blue one is eclipsed below the red one. So this is our eclipse confirmation. And this one is less stable. One of the things I want to highlight is that energy difference between these two conformations is about 3.2 kilocal per mole. So if you remember, the energy difference for eclipsing two hydrogen atoms together with each other in ethane is only 2.9. So here, a methyl group is a sterically more demanding group comparing to the hydrogen. And that is why the delta E here for the eclipse between the methyl and the hydrogen in your propane is larger than what's that observed in ethane, because methyl is bigger than hydrogen. All right, so before we move on, let's do one more practice. Now, from this Newman projection, let's move it back and redraw that um, wedge dash conformation of the same molecule. So what we have here, let's first of all define the axis. Let me put it in the same orientation. Right. So this is what we have. We have a carbon, carbon, CH3, hydrogen. So if you look at it, now the one, two, three, four, these four groups are on the same plan to each other. One, two, three, four. And then you have the wedge. You have the white hydrogen and the blue one coming out. And then on the bottom, you have the blue one and the red one dashing in. All right, so now it's like we, we have the Newman projection, and then we're coming back and redraw our wedge dash conformation. It's the same idea. It's the same molecule. We just like look at it differently. Right? That's the Newman projection way of looking. They're eclipsing on top of each other. And this is the wedge dash conformation of drawing. All right. So that's for propane. And let's take it one more step and looking at another example of butane. OK, so that's replacing one of the hydrogen here, yet with another methyl group. And let's see where we are. I want to put it to the same way I have here. All right, so here it is. All right, so looking at this molecule, likewise, we have the methyl group, carbon, carbon, methyl group. So these four groups define the plan of the molecule. And then here you have a blue one wedge out. You have a red one that's dashed in. Similarly, here you have the red one wedge out, the blue one that's dashed in. So again, just looking at your molecular kit and draw the wedge dash notation accordingly. Uh, I'll take more questions after I finish this section. And what I want to show you is the potential energy surface of the rotation of the single bond. So we're looking at the single bond here again. I already gave the skeleton of this energy diagram. And now we can look at it in a little bit more detail. First thing, for reading this energy diagram, first of all, you look at it, you're like, OK, so y-axis, that's the torsion strength, that's the energy in kilocal per mole. On the x-axis, that's the torsional angle. 
Right, so what we're doing here is we're putting it, <coughs> let's see, we're putting it in the starting post, and we define that to be our zero degree, and then we're just rotating it 60 degree by 60 degree. And what we're doing is plotting the energy change while we're rotating along that single bound. So we start from this conversation, conformation here. Obviously, this conformation is pretty stable. We have the two methyl groups, which are sterically demanding. They're as far away from each other as possible. So in this conformation, what we have is a methyl group anti to another methyl group. Right, so the top one, the methyl is pointing up. The bottom one, the methyl is pointing down. So this is our most stable conformation, and we call it the anti-conformation. It is most stable because your methyl group, the most directly demanding group, are as far away from each other as possible. And on this diagram, we manually define this line to be 0.0 kilocal per mole. So that's our reference point. That's the lowest energy point. And then relative to this point, now what we're doing is we're rotating our single bond and see what is going to happen. For example, we can rotate it, the bottom one, by 60 degrees, and we end up with an eclipse conformation. So in here, Obviously, the eclipse conformation is going to be higher in energy comparing to our anti-standard conformation. So in this case, you have a methyl group eclipsed with a hydrogen. This methyl group is also eclipsed with a hydrogen. I write it as H3C just because it's um, carbon attached to the other carbon. It's just a notation. It's the same way of writing as CH3. And this position, this eclipse conformation, this one is 3.6 kilocal per mole, higher in energy compared to your anti-conformation. And note that if we compare this 3.6 to this uh, 3.2, this one is even higher in energy comparing to what we see in propyl, in propane. All right. <coughs> and then keep rotating the bottom one by another 60 degree. We're getting back to another standard conformation. But in the staggered conformation, the second staggered conformation is not as stable as your first one. And the reason this one is not as stable as your anti-conformation is now if we look at the, the distance between these two methyl groups, we're expecting an um, additional steric repulsion comparing to what we see in the anti-conformation. So specifically, these two conformation, where although your two methyl group are staggered with each other, they're pretty close to each other. These two are called Gauche conformation. And it's a relatively less stable staggered conformation. They are still pretty stable comparing to your eclipse conformation, but the Gauche conformation is less stable compared to the anti-conformation. And again, we can manually, uh, no, we didn't manually define, but comparing to our relative zero, which is our anti-conformation, our Gauche conformation is about 0.9 kilocal per mole, higher in energy comparing to your anti-conformation. And keep rotating the bottom one by another 60 degree, we get to our worst conformation, where you have the two methyl group that are eclipsing with each other. All right, so what we have here is the two methyl group are eclipsing with each other, and this one is our least stable conformation, or largest repulsion. So the bottom line here is when you put two groups that are sterically demanding in close proximity with each other, you're always introducing some kind of conformational strain. The closer and the bigger these two groups are, the larger that conformational strain you're expecting it to be. So in this case, in this least stable eclipse conformation, we're experiencing a torsional strain of about 4.0 kilocal per mole. All right. 
So I want to quickly pause here as this one is a representation on how questions may be asked when we talk about confirmations. For example, there can be a missing human projection like structures, right? I can give you the general form and say, hey, we start from the anti, you rotate it by 60 degree, what's the human projection you're expecting it to be? The other way to ask is, for example, now you have the anti and the gauche conformation. I could ask you, like, why the gauche is more st less stable compared to your anti conformation? And that is because of the um, repulsion between the methyl group. And likewise, um, the other way to think about this kind of question is these numbers are given, but these numbers actually tell you more information about the chemical um, relationship between these conformations. Right, so we know the arena's equation. So the small const rate constant K equals to A times exponential negative EA RT. So say if my EA are these numbers, I can ask you to calculate the relative rate in rotating different chemical bonds, depending on what other groups you have. And to take it one more step, now imagine your methyl group can be replaced with sterically even more bulkier group, like an isopropyl group or a terminal group. So the example would be something like this. You can do that yourself and try to figure out, um, like, now if we have more than two methyl groups what does my energy profile looks like? And how do we understand these energy profiles? All right, I'll pause here for some questions we have. I have about five minutes. Yes. So the quick answer is you do not need a perspective um, diagram to get the Newman projection but it's going to help you to, under, to visualize what that molecule looks like in three-dimensional. And also, with some practice, you might, not, you might be able to do it without a molecular kit, but I highly recommend you at least practice with a molecular kit, or you can use some of the 3D visualization software that's available online to look at what that molecule is in three-dimensional. Right, so the quick answer here is it doesn't matter. So you can look at it from either top or bottom. So let me just put it back to profane. Right, so for example, this one is where we have, right? We put that muscle group on the top. So if I flip it and draw the Newman projection in that, we are the same Newman projection. They are the same molecule, same conformation. It doesn't matter which way you draw it. And that's actually a good point. So for example, I can give you a molecule like, right, so this one is where we started, right? And I can give you another Newman projection, say if I draw it like this, and say, let's see, that's CH3, hydrogen, hydrogen, and this one is hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. And these two will be just equivalent to each other. They're the same conformation, they're the same molecule, just different perspective. Oh, sorry, I think I joined the other way. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you get the idea, right? So just different perspective, it gives you the same molecule. Yes. You, sh you can, but it doesn't matter. The quick answer is why we don't use wedge dash for the CH3 here. The quick answer is yes, but we don't care about these hydrogens. Yes. Um, so by just looking at the wedge dash, what you can tell is these two hydrogens are both wedged in the same phase. So they are eclipse with each other. It's a little bit harder to tell whether a molecule is staggered or eclipsed by looking at the wedge dash. So that's why we use human projection. Yes. Yeah, so the question here is why the CH3 is not being drawn in wedge and dash? The quick answer is yes, we can draw it. 
but in this question, it doesn't matter. So we don't draw it out, just to simplify your, the problem a little bit. You can, it's not wrong. Yes. So the quick answer here is, when we talk about kinetic and thermodynamics, when we have those mathematical equations, they are applied to any chemical um, equations. So A to B, breaking of a chemical bond or forming of a new chemical bond, that's a chemical equation. Rotation of the single bond, you can also imagine it as a part of the chemical equilibrium. So for example, let me just get it. So for example, if we have a methane and I ask you to say, hey, the energy difference here is 2.9, right? What is the rate, relative rate of rotating a bond in methane? And what is the relative rate of rotating a bond in propane? You can calculate that kinetic um, rate constant, yes. So here, that's the torsional energy. So these energy are the energy required to rotate that single bond. All right, so these are the torsional energy that's required to rotate that single bond from this conformation to this conformation. And from, let me get finished. So from here, from A to B, that's the energy required for that rotation to take place. From B to C, it's downhill, right? So now that's the energy that's being released. So when you're looking at this kind of diagram, you want to think about what is happening in that process. So say if this is A, this is B, and then this is C. So from A to B, that's an uphill process. That's an endergonic process. And from B to C, that's a downhill process. That's an exothermic process. It releases energy. So we'll talk more after um, on these details. Do we have, yeah. Right, so the, the question here is why the Gauche conformation are more stable comparing to the Eclipse conformation. So if you think about it, when we're talking about Gauche, um, being less stable, we're comparing that conformation with the anti-conformation, right? So a Gauche conformation, you have the two methyl groups, they're still staggered to each other, they're still not um, directly on the same plane with each other. In the eclipse conformation, for example, now the hydrogen on the top and the methyl on the bottom, and here also are the methyl on the top, and hydrogen on the bottom, they're directly on the same plane with each other. So that eclipse energy is much more, it's causing much more um, conformational strength comparing to that in your Gauche conformation. So it's all about energy, right? It's all about how much torsional energy you need to sacrifice. So even if we're just eclipsing hydrogen with hydrogen, like in the ethane case, we're experiencing something of 2.9 kilocal per mole by eclipsing the hydrogen atom on top of each other. But in this case, the staggering, um, in the stagger conformation, by putting the methyl group in similar position to each other in the Gauche conformation, Yes, it is unfavored compared to the anti-conformation by about 0.9 kcal per mole, but it is not nearly as bad as eclipsing the groups together. I'll take one more question, and then if you have more questions on the conformational analysis, we'll meet outside because I really want to go over the list of topics on midterm with you. Yes, question? Yes. So in this conformation here, <laughs> I'm pointing out with my finger, I don't know. So this, in this conformation here, you can rotate it in this way. And let's just put this back into our wedge dash conformation. Now it becomes quite obvious, right? The, the carbon, 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 carbon here are on the same plane with each other. The blue one are wedged out. The red one are dashed in. 
And if you look at it, these two methyl groups are really close to each other when you put it onto a different perspective. So this is why I highly recommend you to get a molecular kit. Just play around with it, rotate it in your hand, and you'll see how these um, interactions behave. Even if you don't have a molecular kit, just borrow one from your friend, get a few bow and mix um, from them, and just start playing around with it. All right. So again, I'll be outside taking more questions, but now I would like to move on to a quick overview or a review of materials we covered for midterm one. So let's come back here. All right. So this class is organic chemistry one. In this part, before the midterm one, all the way from lecture one, all the way to today, we spend lots of time talking about the basic vocabulary of organic chemistry. When we say vocabulary, these are the things you need to talk like an organic chemist. So from after today, you should be able to enter a conversation and say, hey, this is a drug molecule. We're talking about the SP carbon of this drug molecule. Or we're looking at the aldehyde being the reactive center of this drug molecule. Right? You should be able to start talk like a chemist, organic chemist, I mean. So it's a quick review. Uh, again, what I want to do is I'll go over this list. These are the topics we covered for, um, or the topics we covered from day one to today. And these are my expectations for you on the exam. And now after every summary of the lecture, I'll ask you to raise a hand if you want me to spend more time on this topic on our Wednesday's lecture. First thing, in our first lecture, we quickly reviewed some of the things you covered in 14a and b, which namely we start from atomic structure, which means what is an atom, right? So nowadays, our modern understanding of a chemical atom is from quantum mechanics. We have four different quantum numbers describing every electron in an atom. The first three, n, l, and m, gives you a special combination of an atomic orbital. So atomic orbital is a wave function people get by solving the Schrodinger equation. And in each atomic orbital, your electron can take two different spins, one spin up, one spin down. So my expectation to you is, first of all, know the physical meaning of these atomic orbitals, their mathematical functions. And now know how to draw or how to sketch the shape of these atomic orbitals, especially S and P atomic orbitals, and also know how to assign electron configurations to different atoms. And then we end up um, our first lecture talking about molecular structures. You can expect some stoichiometry problems, like using empirical formula, which tells you ratio of different elements in a molecule, a molecular formula, which gives you the exact number of atoms in a specific molecule. And in that regard, for molecules with the same molecular formula, means they have the same number of atoms in them, they can have different constitutional isomers. So constitutional isomers, they have the same constitute, constitute of atoms, but the connectivity might be very different. We also spent some time talking about sketching your molecule. You can use bond line formula, um, the Kukila formula, the condensed formula. So these are all ways like chemists use trying to represent the connectivity of atoms um, of a molecule in three dimensions. We also went over the wedge dash notation. We did that a lot today as well. So that gives you a better understanding of what your molecule looks like in three dimensional. So raise your hand if you want me to spend some time going over problems and reviews on this topic. OK, sounds good, like what I expected. Next topic, we talk about classical bonding theory, which in this one, in the classical bonding picture, again, it is a theory that's not technically speaking correct because we know electrons are not particles, um, but they're very useful in organic chemistry. So in classical bonding theory, we treat a covalent bond as sharing of electron pairs. With that in hand, people, uh, we went over drawing of Lewis dot diagram, the uh, octet rule, how to assign formal charge, etc. And we also went over drawing of the resonance structures. Now you have different ways to draw the same molecule um, 
and like you have different rank and structures that tells you information about the like, chemical bond lengths, et cetera, et cetera. So raise your hand if you want to hear more simple problems on resonance structures, Lewis dot diagram, classical bonding theory, et cetera. Okay. So be honest with me, right? We only have nine lectures. If nobody raised their hand, I'll just skip next Wednesday's class. So just kidding. I'll still be here, but Next topic, we're talking about quantum um, bonding theory. So in the quantum bonding theory, there are two different types of bonding theory, right? So the molecular orbital theory, we have the linear combination of atomic orbitals to create molecular orbital. So that's one lead bonding theory. For that molecular orbital theory, you should be able to know the MOs can be created by overlay different atomic orbitals, either constructive or destructive way, to form bonding and anti-bonding molecular orbitals. Um, I also expect you to know how to draw the correlation diagram. But again, that's not a, my main focus, so my expectation to you is more like, hey, know how to draw the basic correlation diagram, not to go too crazy about it. And then we have the valence bond theory. So these two theories work very different from each other. Do not mix them up. So MO theory, bonding, anti-bonding, correlation, etc. Valence bond theory is a product of singly occupied atomic orbitals. It gives you a better description of where the electron densities are. So for valence bond theory to be effective in organic chemistry, people also introduce the um, promotion and hybridization theory. And I also ex expect you to know how to draw your pi bonds and triple bonds, right? A pi bond is like a burger, if you remember that. All right, so any questions on this one if you want to spend more time on Wednesday on this one? OK, looks good. We have 50%. And in this two series, raise your hand if MO theory confuses you more. Raise your hand if valence bond theory confuses you more. Okay. All right. Next one. Lecture four. So lecture four is a more quantitative lecture. When we say quantitative, uh, it means it involves some calculation, plugging numbers, um, getting calculation right to have some well, numbers as your answer, right? So in lecture four, we went over basic thermodynamics and equilibrium and also basic kinetics and rate of the reaction. So for thermodynamics and equilibrium, we spent some time looking at the equilibrium constant for a reaction. I'm just using A and B in equilibrium with each other. Also, the equilibrium constant is closely related to some thermodynamic properties like Gibbs free energy, delta G, you can also calculate the standard state Gibbs free energy by delta H and delta S at a certain temperature. So for this class, I mean, we're organic chemistry. These are important. But I want to ask you two specific questions about things that are not uh, in their standard state. So we'll be focusing on standard state only. So effect of pressure, um, that's something else that's a little bit beyond the scope of this class. Kinetics is another topic um, in this lecture four, where we're closely related kinetic to reaction rate. So let's imagine A and B would react to give you product C, and we can expect the rate of this reaction to be given by a rate constant and concentration of your product uh, reactant A and concentration of your reactant B. So rate is rate constant times concentration of your reactants. Depending on how many reactants you have, you might have first order, second order, et cetera. Also, we use Arena's equation. Um, to help you quantify what is your rate constant K is. So here A is a constant, EA, that's the activation energy barrier, R is a constant, T is a temperature. So this is when I made the previous connection between the arena's equation and also your rotation of a chemical bond. So say this rotation of the chemical bond is giving you information like activation energy, and you can use the arena's equation to derive the relative rate between two different types of rotation taking place. So this is one of the things I want to um, highlight is when we're talking about kinetics and thermodynamics, 
they look like just plug-in numbers, but also understand they can be uniformly applied to any chemical reactions of interest. So not only like I give you a number for a random reaction, it might be related to like conformational analysis, etc. So raise your hand if you want me to spend some time on this topic. Okay, I thought I did a good job on this one. <laughs> All right. This one is the arrow pushing mechanism. So I listed um, a bunch of arrow pushing examples or the generalized reactions that I expect you to know. So these are generalized reactions. And again, we use arrow pushing to direct where is the electron flowing in a chemical reaction. So I stated several times, what I expect you to know is if I give you the reactant and the product, can you use the arrow pushing to finish this reaction mechanism? Or alternatively, if I give you the reaction and the arrow pushing, can you predict what the product will be? So there are two different ways I can ask you a question about. And here, these are the general reactions, so I'll just go over them quickly here. We use arrow pushing to direct the flow of the electron. We start by looking at react, um, A and B, and where the electron used to be is in the chemical bond here. After the chemical bond breaking, the reaction ends up on atom B. Also sort of tell us atom B is more electron negative than A. So when we're doing the arrow pushing, we end up doing that. Right? So the electron is coming from the bond, flowing towards your atom B, and breaking that single bond. Um, we also cover the homolytic cleavage of a covalent bond. So a homolytic cleavage is, means we start from two electrons in your single bond, and then one of it go to one carbon, uh, one X atom here, the other go to the other X. Right? It's just moving of the one single electron, so it's one uh, single-ended um, arrow. This one is not only a textbook, so I want you to specify a little bit more. You can also have bond forming. So in here, you have the um, A and B reacting with each other. It's almost like two charges coming to each other. So electron used to be on B. Now it's moving to atom A. And we're forming a new chemical bond here. Or that's where the new electron pair is. You can also have that kind of interaction between two neutral atoms. So this one is like a Lewis acid-based reaction. So we're starting from B to A. We form a new single bond, but you could expect formal charges build up. So note that in all these chemical reactions, your charge need to be balanced up. We do not create or destroy electrons along the way. And then we have a series of more complicated reactions, if you may. We have more than one arrow. You can have the substitution reaction, means that we're uh, making a new bond between the nucleophile and the A atom. And at the same time, we're breaking the chemical bond between A and B. So this is what we are drawing. Right? So it's a substitution reaction. Um, we can also have this kind of reaction, um, which is addition um, to the double bond. So here we have nucleophile and AB double bond. So the way to draw it is you have the electron towards A, and then the electron in the double bond moves to B. So the res result of that addition reaction is we're forming a new bond between A and nucleophile. The double bond between A and B is being reduced to a single bond. The lump pair moves on to atom B. I'll post these lecture notes later on as well. Likewise, you can also have the similar type of nucleophilic attack um, addition onto a double bond when the nucleophile is binded to one end of that double bond. So for example, this one, we have the nucleophile attacking A and the electron in B, um, in the double bond goes to B. So if you look closely in these two relationships, these two are actually resonant structure to each other. We're not moving any of the atoms, we're only moving the electrons. So these are actually resonance. And we use the double-ended arrow to represent the resonance structure. 
And at the very end, just keep in mind the double bond itself can also act as a nucleophile. So the pi electron in a double bond can be donated into some other electrophile to make new chemical bonds. So we can have addition or electrophilic addition. So now the electron comes from the double bond, goes to an electrophile. Whether or not this new chemical bond is being formed between B or A, that's a little bit beyond the scope of this class. Uh, that relates to the stability of the carbocation that's being formed, so I don't expect you to know. Just know when joining the um, electrophilic addition to a double bond, the arrow starts from the double bond. The electron is in your double bond, not on your electrophile. All right, so raise your hand if you want me to spend more time on this topic. Okay. Uh, all right, topic number six, we have acid-base chemistry. So this part, again, it has some quantitative um, character of it. For example, you should know what's the definition of Brownstein acid base. Brownstein acid is a proton donor. Brownstein base is a proton acceptor. You should know how to calculate pH and pKa and Ka, et cetera, et cetera. But since it's organic chemistry, I'm not going to go too hard in calculating pH and pKa for these processes. So some quantitative, but nothing too crazy. What's important for acid-base chemistry here is how to predict or how to identify the relative acidity of a molecule. So here, the most important thing I want you to take home, if you're going to remember anything of acid-base chemistry outside this classroom, that's this sentence. More stable conjugate base, more, more, more acidic. Right. So whenever you're asking to compare acidity of a specific hydrogen, looking at the stability of its conjugate base. And for this lecture, we went, also went over the concept of Lewis acid base. So Lewis acid base is a different kind of definition. So here we're talking about um, electron pair acceptor and electron pair donor. A Lewis acid is electron pair acceptor. It does not have valence of electron. So the typical Lewis acid you would have are early um, elements like beryllium, boron, aluminum, etc., etc. Lewis base, on the other hand, they are electron pair donor. So all electron, all nucleophiles or electron pair donors are Lewis base, and all Lewis acids are electrophiles. They want to accept electrons. So raise your hand if you want to see more about acid-base chemistry on Wednesday. Okay. All right, functional group. So number lecture seven is more of your uh, stereotype organic chemistry. You have a long list of different groups. So here's the thing. Don't spend too much time memorizing what they are. My exams are open book, open notes. Um, try to look at it, get familiar with them. And for example, I expect you to look at a complicated molecule and tell me where are the emit group. Or if you look at a, say, a ketone group, tell me what are the electrophile and nucleophile part of that functional group is. So raise your hand if you want to see more of functional group. You see, this is what I'm a little bit confused. I thought I did a good job, but OK. Conformers. Uh, Conformers, we, well, we just picked up um, from where we left over on our Wednesday lecture. But we're looking at conformations. We're talking about the same molecule, but we're rotating different single bonds. We're getting different conformation of the same molecule. And in order to better understand conformation of the molecule, we can have human projection. And we went over how to read and write the potential energy surface of those single bond rotation. The examples we did are butane, propane, and also ethane. But you can also easily imagine that go to more complicated molecules as well. So raise your hand if you want to want me to spend more time on it. OK, fine. That's OK. All right. And the last topic, stereochemistry. So since Dr. Anderson is here um, to talk with you on stereochemistry, I think she did 
a little bit more than what I expected, um, but it's a good thing, right? So what I want to make sure is I know um, to have you know what I expect for you for midterm one. So for midterm one, I want you to know what the definition of chirality. So say in something, in some of a more complicated molecule, tell me how many chiral centers are there. And also like what's the definition of chirality when we're talking about this, mirror image, et cetera. And also, you're expected to know how to assign the absolute stereo configuration, so R and S configuration, of a specific um, stereo center. What I don't expect you to know for now is we will spend more time talking about stereo chemistry on Friday, especially when we have a molecule with multiple stereo centers. So right now, my expectation to you on um, the midterm exam is know what is a chiral molecule, how to identify chiral center in a complicated molecule, and know how to assign the absolute stereo configuration of these chiral centers. All right, I'll take more questions outside. Yes, that's right.